We are blessed this evening to gather for Good Friday with many other faithful and guests of St. John's Lutheran Church in Des Moines, Iowa. We are thankful for everyone who has offered their gifts at worship and made this broadcast possible. We hope that you will gather with us Sunday at 8.30 a.m. for Easter Communion. The FM transmitter will be used as we remain in our cars during this time of COVID. Life and death stand side by side as we enter into Good Friday. The festal garments of our chancel have been stripped away as we anticipate the crucifixion. We will walk with Jesus through the witness of the Passion according to St. John. This moving narrative reveals the power and glory of Jesus, the Lamb of God sacrificed at the Passover. Standing with the disciples at the foot of the cross, we gather around the tree that bears Jesus, giving thanks that it is indeed the tree of life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. 
I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing next nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. They took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this of your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. 
So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed he is the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend to the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. <laughs> So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on the other side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, 
He said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. Those things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. In the Nuremberg war crime trials post-World War II, there was a witness who came and took the stand at this trial, and he told the story about he, how he, along with a number of others, had escaped the gas chambers for a while in a Jewish graveyard. During this time, 
he wrote poetry, and in one of his poems was the description of a birth which had taken place in a grave nearby. This 80-year-plus old man wrapped in a linen shroud helped to deliver the birth of a little baby boy. When the child uttered his first cry, the old man prayed, Great God, hast thou finally sent the Messiah to us? For who else than the Savior himself could possibly be born in a grave? But after three days passed, this old poet saw the child sucking his mother's tears because she had no more milk left for him. Certainly a tragic and painful story. Yet doesn't it set the mood, the stage, for this event of Good Friday? This time when we relive another real-life story of the suffering and death of a son in the presence of his mother. Jesus lived closer to three decades, of course, than three days, and yet these two both apparently were simply born to die. We come now and we find the courage to be together in this way at the cross of Jesus. After all, we are the reason that he went to that cross. And as we see the guards stripping away Jesus' clothing, making a game of it, and gambling for his robe, we wonder why he was silent, like a sheep before the shearers. When he could have defended himself, we would think, and we even think perhaps he could have freed himself, but chose not to do so. When the progression of the Good Friday story, we see Jesus being stretched out on the cross. We see him being stretched out, and we see those spikes being nailed into his hands, and really it was the wrists where they would make sure that when that cross was lifted upright and jolted down into the hole in the ground, that it wouldn't tear clean through the hands of the one being crucified. We know that as we look at the face of the Lord, it's easy to see that the agony is even much more profound than that of the excruciating pain, the physical pain that he would have gone through during that crucifixion. And we realize that surely there could be no greater burden than for one to bear the weight of all of the sin of the entire human race. And over time, we see him, of course, begin to gasp for breath. Every move made would have been an agonized one because of those six-inch crucifixion nails, one in each wrist, and then a third one over and through his overlapping feet. We've learned from folks in the medical world that there are two things simultaneously going on in the body of a person being crucified. First of all, in a body which is suspended by two arms, we know that the impact of gravity on the blood in that body would cause it to sink to the lower part of the body, eventually not having enough strength to keep pumping blood up into the re reach the heart, resulting in heart failure. But most likely, the real cause of death is suffocation, asphyxiation for most who are crucified. The torn feet with a spike nailed through can only endure so much excruciating pressure. And when they are no longer able to push down into that crucifixion nail in attempts to relieve some of the pressure in the upper body, the torso, in order to allow some breathing to take place. And once the muscles in the arms are so shredded and so painful and so weak 
that they're no longer strong enough to provide any lift to get some slack in the upper body and in the throat. The lungs are stretched so tightly that it is no longer possible to breathe at all. And so as we follow this story, we now see Jesus trying to gather his last bit of strength to rise up slightly just one more time to get just enough air in his lungs to cry out with his final breath. It is finished. Soon it will be dusk. And because it is the eve of the Sabbath and it is not proper for bodies to be hanging on a cross after sunset when the Sabbath has arrived, we see that the soldiers have obviously been commanded to break the legs of those crucified in order that then they would no longer have any capacity to push down and to raise up their bodies to get a lift and another breath. So the soldiers came, violently breaking the legs of first the one and then the other of those two thieves who are hanging on two crosses on either side of Jesus. They're getting ready to come and do the same with Jesus. But when they look at Jesus, it appears that he is already dead. And so one of them very forcefully plunges a spear into the side of Jesus just to make certain. Seeing both blood and water gush out of his side was in fact that telltale sign that these body fluids have already separated, meaning that he is in fact already dead. One cannot help but wonder if at that very moment, as Jesus' mother is watching this, as she stands with the other Marys and so few others, watching in horror and grief, one wonders if she might somehow have a seed of memory going back 30-some years before on that day when she and Joseph brought that tiny little infant Jesus into the temple. And Simeon and Anna were there. And Simeon had said some amazing things about this baby Jesus. But then he had also looked directly at Mary and looked her in the eyes. And he said to Mary these words, And a sword shall, shall pierce your soul also. Jesus' body has now been removed. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea have taken Jesus' body down from the cross and have placed it in a burial tomb before the Sabbath. Is that it? Is it really over? And on a day like today, we have to say, what if the answer is yes? I suppose then that there would not be any reason or purpose for any of us being here or coming together or taking note of this day, other than to simply pay last respects. Perhaps the most appropriate way in which to acknowledge the life of Jesus would be as we would do with anyone else, just out of respect to share an obituary Something perhaps along the lines of we are gathered here together this day to mourn the death of Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was called by some the Messiah. He was born in the city of Bethlehem to Mary, who was betrothed to Joseph of Nazareth. Jesus worked as a carpenter until these last three years of his life when he traveled throughout the countryside, going through villages with a small band of followers. He was teaching and preaching and loving and healing people of all walks of life and all ages and all nationalities. When Jesus passed away and took his last breath just now, this Friday, the eve before the Sabbath, he was approximately 33 years old. Jesus 
is believed to have been preceded in death by his adoptive father, Joseph. He is survived by his mother, Mary, his brother, James, 11 disciples, as well as a number of others who had been followers to some degree or another, at least until recently. Blessed be the memory of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, even though most deserted him at the end, a number of people had been saying that Jesus might possibly be the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. In the lineage of the great warrior king, David, hard to imagine at this point, mostly because of the fact that he did not even save himself, let alone all of the people who were in such need of a great conquering hero with a full-on army to back him up to deliver freedom and victory over the enemy. You probably noticed, given the circumstances, we even thought it was appropriate to clear the altar. So that's why there's nothing left there. Not even the altar candles, which of course representing the light of Christ. I suppose we could consider in the same way the function and purpose of this here garb that I have, starting with this ornate cross, a cross of glory, inappropriate at least, premature at best. And this robe, we call it an alb, symbolic of the robe of righteousness which we all have claimed in and through our baptism, in and through our faith. It represents what all of us have claimed for ourselves. Jesus had spoken of himself as providing the ultimate Passover lamb, the sacrificial gift paying the price for, for purity and for cleanliness and wholeness. Should this be the end of the story, we really have no need or reason to have such a wardrobe, at least for now. This Good Friday, to immerse ourselves into the death of Jesus. It's almost a suffocating experience, isn't it? Because upon Jesus' last breath and burial, this world truly does become a God-forsaken place, at least for the time being. But we can't stand to leave it there, can we? Yes, Good Friday reeks of hopelessness and of despair. And yet, perhaps in the midst of this event, there might even be one more thing that Mary would remember from the voice of Simeon way back in that temple when he greeted this tiny little infant baby. Remember that even when Jesus was that Small, what, six and a half pounds, 21 inches? A real flesh and blood human baby. And Simeon had expressed faith in that little child as the savior of the world, as the Lord of the universe in whom death would not reign, in whom death would not be permanent. So, after all, I suppose... We can hope, can't we, that somehow this whole Judas business and Pilate's involvement and the jeering crowds and the soldiers and all of these things might it just be possible that there is, I know, sounds pretty far-fetched, but still, might there be just some kind of a miraculous thing 
coming out of all this. But of course, after an event such as this, it certainly would take something extraordinary. And so until then, perhaps we can just sort of lean in, try and see if there's some opportunity for anticipation and strain our imaginations and our ears and listen hard for that far off faint strain of news in the form of excited voices and perhaps even a whispering of that spirit-filled tune, Jesus Christ is risen today. But it'll have to wait. No choice but to wait a couple days. But then, Sunday morning, please come quickly. Come running. Come and see the place where they laid his body along with Mary Magdalene, who intends to be there first thing with the intention of caring for the body of her dear Lord and friend, Jesus. And for now, we must go back once more and remember that old man and that baby boy in the Jewish graveyard from the earlier story. There was no happy ending to that story. But the question that elderly man raised is significant. He asked, who else other than the Savior could possibly be born in a grave? Or for that matter, who other than the Messiah could possibly bring new life out of such a thing as a cross or out of a burial tomb? But we'll just have to wait. And as for now, it is finished.